One. For starters, I'm a university student, and my fiancé works full-time, usually borrowing my car to get to and from work. We live together in an apartment complex, so on Friday there were some fun things going on at the school for Halloween. After classes, I pick up the car, go back to the school, and throw my Waldo costume on for some trick-or-treating and bingo fun. I've promised to bring my fiancé food for his 12-hour shift and a cheesecake after work. Special request as he's had a rough week and I wanted to treat him. I pack my bike into the car, probably looking like I'm stealing it, so I don't need to come back later for it. Then get some groceries for the cheesecake on the way home. I get in our apartment door and smell something off. I remember dumping some things in the compost yesterday and decide to take it out even though it's not full. I put away the groceries and set out my cheesecake ingredients to come to room temperature for later. I put my phone on charge, since it's just about dad, and I'll need it later to navigate to my partner's work site. I remember our bedroom and bathroom garbage could use a change too, so I grab the small plastic bag's worth of garbage, along with the compost, and take the mail key too since I'm waiting on a package. I get to the outdoor apartment garbage area and toss my compost, then I hoist up the heavy metal lid of the industrial garbage container about 5 foot 6 inches tall, I'm 5'4", and toss my little garbage bag in a lovely arc. As I admire this, though, I barely have enough time to think, oh shit, before I hear the clink of metal on metal. My mail key. The only mail key we have. I sigh and wonder briefly if I can get another cut, then decide I may as well assess my situation first. I climb on the handle the garbage trucks use to empty these bins and start a visual search. Luckily, there was only enough trash to barely cover the bottom. I reach in to move one of the two things within reach, hoping to hear my key and get an idea of where they fell. It's no use, so I grasp the edges, about to jump in, when someone walks out of the apartment door I left open. He tosses his compost and notices me, still in my Waldo costume. Ask me how my day is going, I deadpan over to him. What? Oh, sorry, I just threw my keys out, and yeah walks over to me and tosses his garbage into the open bin. Then he says, sorry, no speak English. Well, shit. I don't want to waste his time, but I have no way of communicating to him that I'm okay, or why I'll be jumping into the garbage bin. He starts to peer into the bin, and I go back to reaching in to grab and moving things within reach. There were two, but I wasn't ready to just jump in with this stranger there, not understanding and clearly hoping to help. A bad guy grab breaks, he says, oh! and motions for me to hop down. I do, he hops up, and reaches in to grab the garbage bag, not mine or his, from the trash. He presents it to me with a smile. I thank him and shake my head, again trying to explain I threw out a key. I pull out my other keys from the pocket and point to one, then the bin. I'm not sure he understands. He's clearly East Asian, and I don't want to make assumptions and ask, are you Chinese? Japanese? Yeah. Okay. I watch a lot of subbed anime, and I know enough to say it's okay or I'm okay, with horrendous pronunciation and accent. I'm still not sure which is which, but decided won't hurt to try, even though he seems Chinese. Daijobu, I muster. What? He almost seems angry. Nothing, I'm okay, you can go on with your day. I just wish I had my phone to get some rudimentary communication via translation app. He hops down, and without making eye contact, cringing at what I just tried, I jump into the garbage bin. It clangs as the metal shifts under my weight. My next step does too, and someone's milk container shifts to spill in my foot. Seems about right. The man has hopped onto the paddle to watch me now, and I keep my head down, trying to work as fast as I can. I pick up bags and throw them into the empty corner. I bend down, and my wall that has pom-pom rubs against the grimy metal wall, I'll need to do laundry and shower after this. I've gone through about two-thirds of the trash, and I'm losing hope when I hear a cling, and I know I'm close. There, between the wall and another bag, is my key. I grab it, the man goes, ah, and holds his hand out. I pass him the key, but he offers his other hand to get me out. I grab the edges by a corner, and swing a leg up and pull myself out. I'm already grimy, and he's too kind. He hands me the key and we walk back together. I find out his name and that he is new to the building, but the language but the language barrier prevented much else. I thanked him, and we went to our separate floors. 
There was nothing in my mailbox. I was late to get my fiancé food, but got a crazy story I can laugh at, and I hope you can too. The cheesecake was delicious, and there was no lingering smell on my clothes once washed. 2. This summer I got into bushcraft and camping, and decided to add some survival knives to my collection. As anyone who collects knives or anything knows, this can get a bit out of hand. So I ordered several knives, including a very nice ESEE-4 in S35VN. This isn't a huge knife, but it's big enough that you're not going to comfortably pull it out in public without getting some serious looks. So anyways, along with this knife, I decided to order a custom Kydex sheath. This is just a very fancy plastic that holds the knife firmly through friction and being formed to the scales of the knife. I order this sheath from a reputable marketer, whom I probably won't mention, and it is configured for scout carry, which basically means horizontal across the lower back. So my knife and custom Kydex sheath arrive. The knife arrives first and I put it to some use. It's a pleasure to use and quickly becomes my favorite, so I'm excited for the Kydex sheath. When the sheath arrives, I put the knife in it immediately, however, I am quickly disappointed by the amount of friction involved in pulling the knife out of the sheath. It seems excessive, even dangerous. But I've never had a Kydex sheath before, so I figure I don't know what I'm talking about, or the retention will become less intense with time. I fiddle with it for a day, and it doesn't seem to be getting better. Well, like anyone with weird hobbies, I go to my partner and tell her how disappointed I am by this experience. I was looking forward to this sheath, and it just wasn't what I expected, so I show her how difficult it is to pull the knife out. Basically impossible without two hands. I ask her to try, no luck. She's convinced something is wrong with the sheath and needs no more convincing about how dangerous this sheath is. But no, I insist. I have to show her just how dangerous it could be. I tell her to imagine the danger in pulling the knife out while carrying it on my belt horizontally on my lower back. I strap the sheath there and prepare to remove the knife. She is in bed studying with the dog at her feet, and I'm standing in the room. She worries that I might hit the dog if I try to remove it near them, so I take a big step away and pull the knife out. Well, the knife comes flying out with tremendous force and I realize I'm going to look quite stupid if I swing it around the room or do in fact hit someone. Well, I'll just pull back the knife and keep it from flying out too far, I think. This factory sharpened edge then proceeds to return towards the sheath, and effortlessly slides into my left ass cheek until it hits the bone. I feel it stop suddenly, and I realize pretty quickly what I've done. I withdraw the blade as casually as I can. The last inch is soaked in blood, and blood is pooling in my pants. Did you just stab yourself? She asks me, shocked. No! Oh! I lie, unconvincingly. I think you did. I realize now that I definitely did, and it begins to really dawn on me what I've done. Out of embarrassment and a distaste for stitches, I blurt out, We're not going to the hospital. Grab me the first aid kit and the super glue. You're not using super glue. I walk into the bathroom, pull my pants down, and lay on the floor. I'm in shock. I wait there as she starts cleaning up the blood and then runs for the first aid kit in our vehicle. Apparently, she later tells me, I look hilarious on the floor with my ass exposed, covered in blood, trying to crack jokes as I sip water. I try some butterfly sutures, and it will not hold, obviously. After she applies a trauma pad, I finally give in, and we drive to the emergency room. I tell the story to every nurse and my doctor, and they all laugh and say the same thing when they finally see the wound. Wow, you really did stab yourself in the ass! Three hours and four mattress stitches later, I'm on my way home. The knife had cut deep through the muscle, and the mattress stitches are meant to hold the muscle and skin together. I now have a nice scar in my ass, and my partner likes to joke about my buttholes. 3. This happened this afternoon. I am a foreigner living in the Philippines, been here about a year, and a bunch of neighbors invited me to go fishing with them. Turns out by fishing they meant drinking and barbecuing at the beach, which was awesome anyway. I don't imagine a fancy resort or anything, it's pretty close to where I live, but it's really just a small little village on the beach, little wooden shacks and fishermen and many little boats, people drying out seaweed in front of their houses, etc. We drink all day from 10am till about 4pm. 
At some point, around four-ish, one of the local village dudes who had just joined us tells us he had a small net out in the water and he wants to go pull it up. He of course asks the Americano if I want to do it, because I thought we were going fishing. Anyway, I'm like, fuck yeah bro. Now there's another dude with us, one of my neighbors, who also wants to go get the net, and cause we're buddies and his English is pretty good, we decide to go together. Neither of us have done this before, but the waters here are super chilled. It's like waist-high water with no waves. You can literally go like 300 feet out and the water is only chest-high at most. So off we go. We're looking for a set of blue buoys. We have one scrappy oar and a tiny little boat. Though this thing is like 8 foot long, 2 foot wide at the widest point. We're only bringing it out to put the net and fish inside. We're about 400 feet out. We're fucking pushing the boat, wading in water. When my buddy mentions to me that he actually can't swim. Water is getting a little deep, chest high, and he is getting a little scared. I'm like, oh shit, dude, alright, you get in the boat, paddle, and I'll walk, swim alongside. It's good to remember that we're both pissed out of our faces, giggling the whole time and joking about how we're fishermen now. Yeah, I've been fishing these waters since I was just a boy. And putting my ear in the water and telling him how many fish I hear and whatnot. Great times. Giggling all the way. Turns out we had passed our set of buoys ages ago, like we've overshot 300 feet already. The only buoys I see are fucking miles away. At least 7 to 800, maybe 900 more feet. The whole adventure seems like a lot of work, and the fun starts to dissipate. We're actually pretty far out now. The ground disappears. It gets fucking deep, fucking quickly. And we're shit, I don't know, like a thousand feet out from the shore and the water is cold and I'm wondering about sharks and shit swimming alongside our little yacht. I don't know what happens, dude, but very quickly things take a turn. The sky is getting dark, there's rain a few miles away, coming over the mountains towards us. We're the only people out in the waters at this point. And the fucking boat just falls apart. The canoe piece comes apart from the side piece, it rolls over and sinks, I can't keep it upright. Is filled with water, and then I remember my buddy can't swim. He's trying to keep his head above water, trying to hold on to the side piece, which is like a big piece of bamboo. I'm holding on to the bamboo piece with one hand, and also trying to keep this villager dude's boat from sinking. So I got the canoe piece in the other hand. It's heavy and cumbersome. Dude, very quickly I realize this is serious. This guy can't swim, it's 400 feet of very deep water, until we can sort of stand. And then it's another 600 feet of head to neck water high, and there's not a soul in sight. We float along. I'm trying to keep him calm, telling him to just hold on to the bamboo, just relax, someone will see us, etc. But it's also getting to dark clouds, heavy Southeast Asian rain is coming. We float into a serious netting area, there's wires and ropes everywhere around your feet in the darkness below. And other than it being fucking thalassophobically terrifying, it's dangerous. My arms and legs are getting tangled, I'm struggling. My body is getting tangled. Shit is going south quick. The bang means help in Bisaya. <laughs> and luckily for us, at that moment, an engine noise appears and we scream for help. A guy pulls up in a much bigger homemade boat, and he's got a bottle of rum in his hand and he's like, Unsa man, what's wrong? He gets us aboard. Loads our little ass boat onto his boat. And in the style of, well, there's your problem right there, he announces that our boat is too small. Anyway, we're safe. The net is still out there. The owner of the boat thought it was hilarious. We'll get it fixed. 4. I want a pet, but I rent a room, and locking a dog or a cat up in my room all day while I'm away 10 hours at my job isn't something I want in my conscience. So I thought about mantids, and while I may still get a mantid of some sort, I was really vibing on tarantulas and tarantula videos. For the past three weeks I've been watching tarantula videos, husbandry species, beginner, communal, a laundry list of topics. It appears there is a great community of people on the YouTubes and such who like to take a lot of videos and share a whole host of knowledge. I am very grateful for them because it helped me pick up what tarantula I wanted to chill with on my desk while I'm redditing. Pumpkin Patch Tarantula Pelopus SP 
this would be my first tarantula, and everyone at work thinks I'm nuts. One guy came to my desk, looked at the tarantula video on my screen and said, Ew, you can't be serious. I said, well, you guys haven't cared about the one I've been keeping under here for the last month. <laughs> yeah, he jumped back in fear. Apparently, the pumpkin patch tarantula spiderlings come about three-eighths of an inch from tiptoe to tiptoe. They come very small, and you can feed it cricket legs so the sling doesn't get hurt by the prey. There is so much health information out there. I have three vivariums set up, and I've been looking for a jumping spider to spider nap for the freezing cold over the past few nights. I got paid last Tuesday, and I was finally ready to purchase a pumpkin patch tarantula over the internet. I picked a company, I'd been looking at a lot on the interwebs, and the price was right, and boom, the credit card came out. They have an arrive alive guarantee, so they really do their due diligence to make sure that the tarantula makes it to you alive. Turns out I'm very glad they do. This morning I was worried because I hadn't received the tracking number, but I did know their shipping schedules. It's posted on the site very directly. I even asked my roommate to be around for the delivery, but still no tracking number. Curious. I opened my junk folder for that email, and there it is, you must reply, sent like three days ago, saying that something with the address doesn't look right. I've been under a little stress lately, a lot of deadlines are trying to be met, and I'm getting stretched pretty thin, so in a panic, I reply that I'm sure that the shipping and billing address are correct. I've lived there six months. I very confidently know my address, I deal with numbers every day, and customers, some smarter than others. I, as a customer, am of the latter. They asked me for verification, so I sent them pictures of a piece of mail with my name and address on it. I took a screen snap of the billing and delivered numbers, and they are the same, and sent that to them, saying both numbers are the same on the billing and delivery receipt. I even circled my address as being correct in the top and bottom of the form. Yes, please send me my tarantula to love forever. I thought they were telling me that the billing address and delivery address were not the same numbers, which I can clearly see on the receipt from their website. At one point, through our 21 emails, this poor person said, If you need someone to translate this in English for you, to make sure you understand, please seek someone out. I don't know how to make you understand. AKA, you can't fix stupid. And I very confidently said, Well, if I have to make a YouTube video showing you how the numbers are the same, I will. They tell me very nicely that my piece of mail address actually is the issue. My home mail didn't match the billing and shipping numbers. I paid for this with my card, so my billing must be right. I get mail from my card company. All of my other deliveries get here with no problem. So I tell them when I get home, I'll put this wrong address business to rest, and send them another piece of mail I have somewhere that has my real address on it. I handed the piece of mail I used to my roommate, and told them about the issues I've been having all day, and they said, Yeah, this isn't your address. I very confidently entered the wrong address on the website and insisted it was my address all day long. I wanted to die. I put this poor person through the ringer today as they had to deal with my damn stubborn ass all day. I'm still feeling bad for putting that person through all that, oh my god. I'm very grateful that they didn't just ship it because it wouldn't have made it here alive. I work in customer service too, and yeah, some days I... Wow, it was me this time. I come by it. Honestly? 5. Imagine a guy in his early 20s. Now imagine this guy in his own trailer. During this time, I didn't like to cook or do dishes or anything that took extra time out of my day. What I did end up doing instead, usually microwave food or sandwiches. The day in question, clear and sunny. I wanted a snack but didn't want anything I normally ate, then it hit me. I had a frozen bag of fries in my freezer. I took them out and read the back. It told me how to cook them in the oven, fryer, and something else I do not recall. I frowned, no microwave instructions. I stared blankly at my frozen confection of lazy endeavors and came up with a plan. Since it doesn't have microwave instructions, I will test it with a small number of fries first. Getting a paper plate, I poured some and covered with a paper towel because who wants to waste time cleaning a microwave up after a mess is made, right? I then made my third mistake of the day. I was at three so far. You'll find out. I then put the timer for two minutes and thirty seconds, proceeding to the back of the trailer to continue laundry. I let the entire time elapse and the microwave sings the song of my people. My ears and head perk up like a deer that sends something of interest. 
I walk to the kitchen and to my dismay a huge amount of smoke is spilling out of the microwave. That's when I made my fourth mistake by opening up the cursed food cooker and I'm now hit with a cloud of nasty smelling burnt fries who have suffered the most horrible death known to man. The mistake I didn't mention yet, I didn't have windows open and soon my entire trailer was singing a song of perceived horror, smoke detectors and as I rush to open doors, wave smoke away from the singing sirens, and air out the trailer, I have an idea. I would like to mention a normal person would realize the mistake they made and would follow the instructions to make a second batch. Sadly, I am not normal, and I just crit failed my INT check. I decided on the spot, after looking at my charred sacrifice, that I cooked it for too long, and put another batch in for a shorter time, I think about one minute less than the first attempt. I then, running with the theme of me not learning my lesson, leave my microwave to make even more poor life decisions than I have by letting it commit to my request. Cut to the timer going off, and it's time for the moment of truth. I approach cautiously, not knowing what to expect. I press the door release and flinch as I'm greeted with no smoke. I open my eyes and look in. The fries, they look beautiful, they look edible, they look complete. My life is now complete. I got my choice of dip the fabled bottle of ketchup, and pour it on the side. I take a bite and realize my fifth, sixth, and seventh mistake all at once. I'm sat down with no immediate escape to the bathroom, or a place to deposit this horrid trash I cursed upon my taste buds. The moral of the story, if it doesn't have microwave instructions, don't use the microwave. Hey everybody, Hellfraser here, and thank you very much for listening to Embarrassing Stories, episode 88. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories and sent in stories for use in this video. If you enjoyed the video, then please do like and subscribe. Also, if you have a story of your own for this or any other of the videos I do, please do send it along to kingofthecities at gmail.com. Okay, do we have birthday shout outs? That's a good question. Nope. No, I don't think we have any today. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, as such, I'm going to keep the rest of the outro short, uh, then go have a lie down, because I'm feeling like I want to have a lie down. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.